said, my name is Melissa Dye. I work with Quest Diagnostics in the Health Fair Department. Um, I've been here about 19 years, so I've done this once or twice. But as we know, it's a very changeable thing. And after these last couple of years, everything has changed. So uh, that's why we do this refresher course. Uh, first thing I would like to point out is that I am aware that Nine Health has changed their branding and their name and their Nine Health 365 now. I was unable to get this PowerPoint reworked to get the new logos in. So I apologize for that. Next time you see it, it'll be all new from the get. So some old logos on here, but same information. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So I really do want to thank everybody for doing this. Uh, it's been a crazy couple of years. So happy to be back and to be partnered with our long-term partners at Nine Health. And we absolutely could not do it without the volunteer base and all the hours and time and sweat and blood that you guys put into this. So uh, thank you so much for doing this and we're gonna have a great year. I'm very excited. This PowerPoint is intended to kind of touch on everything that you're going to need to know for the, the fair, the day of your fair. I know a lot of you have done it before. There's probably some people on here who never have. So it's kind of a general PowerPoint. I'm going to try to hit everything. You guys are, um, if you've responded to me with your address, you should have received a lab supervisor manual where they went out yesterday, some of them. I have quite a few people that haven't responded to me with their address. As soon as, I, as soon as I get those, you will get an actual manual of your very own to take there the day of the fair and to use as a resource guide when you're out there at the site. But always, Jerry Bebo is my partner in crime here. She couldn't make this meeting. She and I are always available. There's our phone numbers. Email is probably a better way to reach us just because we're all over the place. But we're always here to answer questions. There's no such thing as a, as a stupid question or that you ask and we all stay on the same page. All right. So what the heck am I doing here in this meeting? Uh, the main role of the lab supervisor is to oversee all the processes in the laboratory and centrifuge area. It's not to draw blood. It's, it's to, you know, be the, be the overseer of all the people who are working. Um, and our, our main goal is keep everybody on track, keep all the processes on track, follow protocol, and make sure that everybody is safe, everybody volunteering, and all of the participants as well. That's why we have a lab supervisor. Hey, Melissa, one quick thing. Um, are you advancing through the slides? I'm still seeing the first slide. You are. I am. Maybe others. Are you guys seeing the first slide, or do you see... It moving through the slides. Still the first one. Yep, right. still the first one. How about now? There we go. That worked. Woohoo! Okay. Back on track. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so, again, I said thank you, and here's our phone number and everything if you need. I will email out this PowerPoint to everybody that's on this call afterwards so you don't have to be writing things down. And, you can review it at your leisure because I know it's so exciting. Here we go. Keep everybody safe. Where did I get to? Okay. We're going to go ahead with our lab supervisor duty. Um, again, please read that manual. Just be familiar with it. You don't have to memorize it, but the day of the fair, if you're going to have a question, it's, it's good to know where stuff is. It's got tabs on it. It's very easy to use but you'll just be familiar with what you have with you. Um, your duties include working with your medical coordinator at the site. If you think you're gonna need extra supplies, for instance, if there's gonna be a lot of larger handed phlebotomists, you're gonna maybe want some large and extra large gloves on hand. We've already gotten a list of how many phlebotomists we think are coming, so you shouldn't need extra sharps. Kind of tight on supplies because of supply chain issues, but we will do our best to supplement anything that you feel that you might need. Your job is to set up the lab area. That might include helping the day before when they do set up, uh, tearing it down at the end of the fair. You're going to do the phlebotomy and centrifuge training the day of the fair. 
And you are, of course, the resource there to provide answers and support to any of the volunteer staff you're working with, as well as to the participants. And you're going to stay there and supervise the phlebotomists and centrifuges all day long. You are the one that's in charge of the supplies. It tends to look like a, a Christmas morning sometimes when we set up a site that everybody wants to open every box and spread everything out all over. That's not necessary. We would like one point person who is the lab supervisor to kind of maintain the supply area. Uh, and you are ultimately responsible for the specimens getting packed correctly. There's going to be a bunch of slides about it, a bunch of stuff in your lab supervisor manual. It's relatively simple, but it's got a few steps to it. You have a hard and fast rule, no children under 18 in the draw area. That's just for their safety. You don't need little ones running around and sticking their hands in sharp containers. That is something that has to be worked out with the parents. Say there's two parents and a baby, one can get their blood drawn and then hand the baby off. And But we do, none of the volunteers can be under 18 in the lab area as well. Does that all make sense? I'll take your silence as a yes. All right, supply conservation. We do want to stay as green as we possibly can. Also, we tend to, we get those supplies back to the laboratory and we will flow them back out if they're unopened. Uh, so that's kind of the reason for you guys being in charge of the supply area. You don't need to open every single rack of SST tubes. You, the phlebotomy area will be set up with one phlebotomy kit for two people. And there's a photo of this coming up. Uh, and they can share part of a rack of SSTs. A rack of SSTs is either 50 or 100. No one phlebotomist is going to be drawing 100 people all by themselves. So they don't need 100 tubes sitting in front of them. So they're going to share that phlebotomy kit. Um, again, we're, gonna, we're just going to stock with what we need. You can always add supplies. You can always break out more things if you need them. But we don't have to open every single box. Please and thank you. We are in the time of COVID or just after or we don't know. Changes all the time. We know that mask mandates have been dropped in a lot of places, but we really still want to maintain the six foot distancing as much as possible. That helps with the flu and the common cold and everything else just as much as COVID. I think it's something that we've all kind of come to expect is a little more personal space when we're out in public. So as much as it works with your site, every site setup is going to be a little different and we understand that. But if you can try to maintain some distance between, you know, walking paths and where the blood is being collected, that's just a safer practice. We do provide chucks for the tables. During the, the surge of COVID, our advice was to turn the chucks over so it could be cleaned off on the back. We know that COVID is not uh, carried on surfaces. It's an airborne thing. So if you feel more comfortable doing it that way, that's fine. There will be plenty of cleaning supplies available at the site. So you can keep everything clean. Otherwise, you can use the chucks as normal, but we're still going to ask that you keep your areas clean and you know do a little wipe down every now and then since people are going to be using the same space. So here's a picture with the chucks turned over. This is kind of our standard phlebotomy draw setup. See that brown box at the top? The lid has been flipped over, and that's where we're going to put the tubes and the hub. All the supplies in the middle are going to be shared between the phlebotomists. So this is just the left side of the table. The right side is a mirror of it, obviously. One sharps container per phlebotomist. That we don't share. Uh, we don't want needles crossing paths in a fair environment for sure. And then gloves, you guys can share a box of gloves. You can pull, these boxes come with 300 pairs of gloves in them. So you can pull some gloves out of someone else's box instead of having to have your very own box. But there's, there's going to be plenty of supplies out there. This I promise you. Doing okay? All right, so again, 
We do enforce strong guidelines for medical professionals. Although this is a fair setting, it's also a medical setting. So we need to remember that and, and the closed toed shoes. Uh, phlebotomists are not required to wear lab coats, but we're gonna use all of the PPE that is, is standard in the medical profession. Um, I know that they have dropped mask mandates in a lot of places. However, the medical field really hasn't. If you go to any doctor's office, hospital, laboratory setting, people are still gonna be wearing masks. And we're gonna ask that everybody at the fair wear a mask as well. This is one of the first big community gatherings that we're able to have, and we wanna keep everybody safe. So you, your perfect volunteer, <laughs> is an experienced phlebotomy volunteer. That's really what we, we try to pull in to help. Um, with current vacutainer proficiency that regularly draw blood samples um, or are currently employed as a phlebotomist. Those are kind of your gold star volunteers that you're gonna get. You're also going to have people that don't draw blood but once a year because they come to the Mind Health Fair to do it and they haven't done it in a little while. I do, we're gonna do a couple of phlebotomy refresher trainings um, for people to sign up for so they can just get a hold of our equipment and, and you know get familiar with how that feels in your hands again. There will be student phlebotomists at a few of the sites. They will be with an instructor. So the instructor is to oversee the student phlebotomist. As the lab supervisor, I, one piece of advice for you in the very beginning of the fair when they do the first round of blood draws is you Scope the room, see who's doing really well, see who might be struggling, help out that one who's struggling, and keep an eye on the one that's doing really well. That might be your hard stick person in case somebody has to have a second collection. So those are gonna be your, your experienced phlebotomy volunteers. All right. The precautions, we all know about it at this point. They will be supplied by Nine Health for and Quest. There will be disposable non latex gloves all over the place. Um, face masks will be provided, but you're welcome to bring your own. A um, hard and fast rule is that gloves have to be changed between each participant. They need to be put on before you begin the blood draw. There's no cutting the finger out so you can feel a vein, no drawing with only a glove on one hand. That's standard medical practice. Everybody should know that. Somebody who's not following that procedure, feel free to give them some instruction. Um, of course, if anything gets torn, soiled, contaminated, anything like that, you are gonna change out your gloves and go wash your hands, clean up your station. Hopefully we don't have any situations like that. And yeah, just again, we know COVID is decreasing, but the population that's gonna come to these fairs is generally a little bit older, might be immunocompromised. So we wanna protect them. Yeah. Don't have a question? Nope, okay. All right, training. In your lab supervisor manual, there's going to be a phlebotomy agreement. You may need to print off some copies of it so that you have plenty for your phlebotomy area. You're gonna have everybody sign that. It's an acknowledgement that they are there as a phlebotomist. They're there to draw <laughs> blood. They understand that there will be blood in the area. It's also a really good way for us to find phone numbers to call somebody back to volunteer again for us. So you're gonna have everybody sign that before they even get started. Your job is to train all the phlebotomists on safe equipment use, the procedures, the expectations. Definitely wanna give it a little bit of time, let people ask questions. Briefly explain the accidental needle stick procedure, which in a, in a sentence is, if you get a needle stick, alert me and everybody stay where they are. That's pretty much all they need to know. You will have the outlined procedure in your book should this rare occasion happen to the needle stick. Uh, are you guys all muted? I keep hearing like, I don't know. 
everybody could just make sure your phones are muted. That would be helpful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, in also in your lab manual book, you're going to get a required sample volume handout, which you'll see on the next slide. It's a real simple handout with actual pictures of what tubes look like when they're full and when they're not full. Uh, it's very important to the lab that we get full tubes. And this is just a visual reminder that that is what is expected of the phlebotomist. Always from the beginning, ask the phlebotomist and the centrifuges if they can help stay to clear up after the fair. They tend to just run off and then you're left by yourself doing all that work. If everybody picks up their own station and at least consolidates it to a, a spot where you can organize it, it helps tremendously to get that fair closed so that you can go home at some point. Okay. Here's our fancy required sample volume handout. We are in the process of switching over to a different vendor for all of our medical supplies. So you may see these old SST tubes with the rubber top, or you may see uh, red plastic with a yellow circle in it. Uh, either or, they're both SST tubes, but I didn't have a picture of the new supplies yet. So I know it's probably hard to see on the screen, but you're gonna get this, this handout. The most anybody's ever gonna have drawn Standard for nine health stars, they pretty much mark everything. They're going to have two SSTs and two lavenders. We don't need more than that. It doesn't fit in our boxes, but we do need those tubes to be full because we pour several different tests off in aliquot from those tubes, especially those SSTs. Um, and if the lavender top isn't full enough, it can upset the, the blood count. So you guys will get a better look at that when you actually. Okay, so specifics of how you're going to train your phlebotomist. Obviously, we all use safety needles and disposable hubs, sharp container for everyone, no sharing. We do need them to be engaging those safeties. So if you notice that someone isn't, please help redirect them. That's there for their protection, as well as anybody who's going to have to handle that sharp container later. Hey, Melissa, quick question. I just want to do an audio check for everybody because someone typed in the chat that they couldn't hear. Um, I don't know if you guys know the raise your hand feature in Zoom. If you are able to hear Melissa, okay. Can you please raise your hand? Hello, check, check, one, two. <laughs> Mike, I saw you're good. Thank you. Everybody else, how are you doing? Janet, your thumbs up. Hey. Okay. If anybody, yeah, I see a lot of hands up. So for those that um, aren't able to hear, um, check your own. You probably have done this, so I apologize. Um, but check your own speaker volume. Make sure that's up as well. We will be sending out a recording of this as well. So the recording might be really helpful um, to listen back to. So. Go ahead, Melissa. It might just differ. Yeah, thank you. No, that's, again, with the technology. Can we just <laughs> go back to in-person meetings? They do much better that way. No. All right. So on this slide, again, we have a breakdown of what to, for what tests. I don't need to go through that specifically because you're going to be able to see it. Most people are going to order kind of the basic a chemistry, a CSA, uh, a vitamin D, and a, a blood count. All of that could be one SST and one lavender. Uh, if they order additional tests, with the vitamin B12, um, are we still doing testosterone? Yes. Yes. Uh, any of those, or if they have a blood typing, that's going to require extra tubes. The blood typing is really important. It can't go in with the, the blood count because it goes to a completely different department in a giant lab. So. Uh, it is important that we get that additional test tube. If they have a COVID antibody test added on, you do not need to draw a third SST. It can be drawn off of one of the two other SST tubes, newer tests that we've added. And just like everybody on the planet, we're having supply chain issues. <laughs> it's been a little nightmarish to get everything we need. Uh, so we want to make sure everybody's using their equipment properly, and I don't want to restrict you, 
but keep an eye to uh, not be very wasteful so that we have plenty for everybody. And okay. All right. Let's look at our requisition. The requisition is pretty standard. It's been this way for many years, which is good because participants are used to saying it and your volunteers that have done it before are gonna know where everything is included on the rec. I know that you probably can't read the writing on your screen, it's way too tiny. What is important to point out here, that upper left-hand portion that is in yellow, that is the patient demographic information. It needs to be in handwriting that we can read when it gets back to the lab and it needs to be complete. What I mean by complete is I need a name, an address, and a date of birth, if nothing else, in order to complete testing and get these results sent out for everybody. The phone number is important because if I have a question about your handwriting or if we need to do a redraw, I need to know how to contact a participant to get them back. So all of these things in yellow are actually very important. There should be a form check person that's going to look over this form. The cashiers look at it. The form check people are going to look at it. And the phlebotomist also is going to get the last chance to take a look at the requisition, make sure it's filled out. If it's missing a field, it's easy to hand participant a pen right there and have them fill it out for you. On the top right are going to be pre-printed specimen labels. This is on what we call the paper rec, which they're going to fill out the day of at the fair. The specimen labels on the top are gonna to be wrapped around the tube. They each have a unique identifier that identifies the site as well as that particular participant and ties them back to their paperwork. So that's important that we know what that is. The whole section in the middle is called the cashier section and that is where the tests are ordered. The left column where X's should be placed for the tests they're choosing and then over in the right column, there's gonna be a total for the amount of money that they've paid. If they are missing X's, you don't know what to draw as far as the phlebotomist, because you don't know what tests they've ordered. They'll need to go back to the cashier and get that straightened out before they come back to phlebotomy. So it's important we know what tests they want and that they have paid or that they've given a voucher. Any questions with that? I like your silence, I do. Uh, patient signature at the bottom, that, that says that I will submit to getting my blood drawn and also there's a Medicare release on there that says you're not going to try to get Medicare to reimburse for these tests because they won't do it because it's a healthcare setting. And most Medicare patients are pretty used to signing all kinds of stuff like that. Okay, we good with that? There also will be we need the witness signature. I'm sorry. Do we need the witness signature? Adele, do we still, is it still very important to have a witness signature? Yeah, this is Alex. Um, we do um, ask for that when they're both on registration and walk-in registration, there's a witness line. So yes, we do that. That volunteer helping with that section has to be 18 or older. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. You got it. This is Vivian. I have a question. Um, did you say that Medicare, so people who are on Medicare cannot come to the health fair unless they pay it themselves? They, of course they can come to the health fair. They just will not be reimbursed by Medicare. We have to let them know. Like if they try to take this paperwork after the fair and submit it through Medicare for reimbursement, it won't, they won't submit it. They won't take it. Um, but they're paying for this themselves. So Medicare is not involved whatsoever. It's just a notification on the bottom to let them know that situation. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, so you are also going to see a lot of electronic requisitions. Our numbers for electronic have been going up for years and that's wonderful. Electronic requisitions, uh, participants can go to the website, sign up days before the fair, pick their test, pay for it with a credit card. They're gonna get a printed, form that they have to print at home 
a lot of them are going to forget it. So they have a, a backup plan at the front where they can, they can fill out um, a blank form, but it's going to be a white form that looks very different from the other forms. Um, electronic registration is, is the wave of the future, and it really is a way for them to get their results back electronically um, very quickly. And Nine Health has done a whole bunch of cool stuff with their website and the resulting, and so it's a, it's a good deal. Uh, it's also easy to read, <laughs> which is helpful for everybody who wants to handle the requisition at any point. Um, so at the site, Nine Health is going to give us a bunch of strips of stickers. Each little tiny sticker pad, sticker strip, um, is for one, one participant. So among those stickers, the top one has a barcode on it. And then there are four others below it that share the same number as that barcode but don't have an actual barcode. The barcode gets placed on the requisition in the upper right-hand corner. And I'll show you that on, on the next slide. And then the other stickers are in place of those pre-printed stickers that we have on the paper rec that are going to go around the top of the tube. Uh, we always need two identifiers, so that's why that's important. Those stickers are going to be kept in the lab area. We used to give them to the participants, and then they would lose them somehow in the 20 feet from the front door to the lab. So we just manage them now. So they'll be at every single phlebotomist station. Um, so it is important that you review this procedure with the phlebotomist and that they see the requisitions when you do the training so that they know what they're expecting and what they're going to look for. Okay, here is a fantastic electronic requisition. You can tell it's similar but a little different. Um, patient demographic information is over there on the left. That should be all filled in because they did this online already. Uh, just below that is the number of hours fasting. People tend to miss that. So that's something for the form person to check and ask them if they're fasting. Phlebotomists can ask that and fill it in there as well. You can see that there's an arrow where it says place the barcode. Up barcode will come with the paperwork. It's already printed on the paperwork. The second barcode uh, that the arrow refers to is from that strip of stickers. And there's, there's a little box for that. Um, again, tests should be marked. Double check for any extra tests that they've marked. We need to make sure the cashiers are aware of that. Um, and then all of our signature places at the bottom of this requisition as well. Any questions? Doing it. Now, just to add a little confusion, uh, there are a few sites that are going to have an RA study. Uh, this is something that we've all partnered together for years to do, and, and it's a really great study getting a lot of data for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there will be a small number of sites that will be participating in the RA study. They will have a special green requisition that they hand out to the participants. So those participants will come with two separate requisitions, either a paper and a green one or an electronic and a green one. This is the time when you do need to draw a third SST tube because one of those goes to the RA study and the other two will go uh, with the regular nine health blood. The RA recs and tubes need to be separated from the other blood work and those need to be spun and put into a shipping box together with other RAs. I didn't know how to word that very well. Um, so all the RAs are going to go in one box. Your electronics will go in another box. And your paper recs will go in another box at an ideal site. Any site that does have an RA study, we are providing extra tubes. So that's always a question if they're going to run out. But we know that, that we're going to need to send extra supplies, and that will be done. I don't have a picture of the requisition, so I'm sorry about that. Any questions on RA? All right, so again, like I've said, we need to check the re registration. The phlebotomist is the last person that has the opportunity to correct an error before it comes to the lab. A name spelling, if someone you know left off their date of birth, things like that. The phlebotomist has 
the last opportunity to gather that information to make the process go smoother down the line. And it's much appreciated by us. Soul tubes, I know I've put that on how many slides now. We had our first fair this last weekend. And, you know, the first one's always a little interesting, but there were, there were a lot of short tubes. Um, and again, it, the aliquoting process becomes really difficult at that point because every test requires a certain minimum. So when you guys are going around and kind of overseeing that first round of first couple rounds of draws, check people's fill volume and just gently remind someone who may be drawing shorter tubes that it is important that we get a full sample. Tubes have to be labeled in front of the participant. They are not to be labeled before the blood draw. You draw the blood and then you have the participant sit there, hold some pressure on the needle area, there's a little mirror. Uh, <laughs> and then it's, it's my practice to say, okay, I'm gonna write your, your name on your tube right in front of you while you're here. And that's also my opportunity to correct the name spelling. If I can't read your handwriting, then I can learn how to spell your name properly on the tube. The second part of that is it gives a chance for the blood to clot so that we don't have people stand up and start dribbling everywhere. It works out for everybody. Uh, we need first name, last name, date of birth, and a sticker from the requisition or the strip around the top of the tube. There's, also, there's a couple other things that we'll talk about on the next slide. It should be inverted eight to 10 times gently. That just helps mix up all the good stuff that's in there with the blood. And there's gonna be a paper tube rack. You're going to start in position one, which is gonna be the bottom left-hand corner and keep those tubes together. So it'll be the purple top in front and then any SSTs directly behind it. Take that person's paperwork Turn it face down on the table under the tube rack. That not only protects their HIPAA information from sitting there on the table, but as they get added up and the rack gets full, it keeps everything in order. That's very important. Again, with tube labeling, here is an example. Last name, first name, uh, I didn't date of birth on there, I should have. Date of birth, um, at these fairs, we also ask that Phlebotomists put a time on the tube, the time of draw. What's important about that is that a lot of your centrifuge volunteers may have not done this before, and they don't know what a fully clotted tube looks like, but they know what 30 minutes is. So if it's that for 30 minutes, it should be good to go. So they keep track of it by the time written on the tube and group them together that way. I also ask for my phlebotomist to put an initial on their tubes and Part of that also is if you're seeing really short tubes or you're seeing a problem or someone you know, isn't using the label around the top, you have their initials so you can figure out who in the room is doing that and help re-educate them so they can do it properly. And then that, that label from the requisition of the strip around the top. That's our second identifier that ties everything to the paperwork. Melissa. Second. Quick question. Um, so someone is asking in the chat if they heard correctly, do they need to separate out day of the fair, so the walk-in registrants from online? Does those blood tubes need to be it, that a new thing? Very helpful. Yes. And that's actually in my my uh, packing slides a little later on. Um, it is helpful because otherwise we have to separate them back here at the lab. They are entered into the computer in a different way, the electronic is one method and the paper is another method. So if they're separated when they get here, they can go right into the flow and start uh, getting processed as opposed to having to go through another sorting process. Gotcha, thank you. You bet. All right, so phlebotomy is only half of this. Centrifuge is the other half of your duties. There is a centrifuge volunteer agreement similar to the full body of the agreement. You're gonna have all of them sign those at the beginning. We need to explain the proper centrifuge procedure, including how to balance, um, you know, balance tube with water in it, balance the centrifuge. A lot, a lot of people who are interested but aren't necessarily medical do end up doing centrifuge volunteering. So you have to explain it as if 
They've never done it before because maybe they haven't. Um, again, emphasize the importance of keeping the tubes in order with the paperwork. It can be a little confusing that you have to take part of the tubes out to spin them and not all of them. Um, so it's worth taking the time to explain why it's important that everything stay in order and to double check everything. More centrifuge tips. If you have enough volunteers or you've got somebody who super centrifuger that has been doing this for years, sometimes it's good to kind of delegate a little bit of that um, oversight to them since they will be in the centrifuge area. The lab supervisor tends to get pulled over to the phlebotomy area. So it, it's good if you have somebody who can be your second set of eyes over at centrifuge. There are two kinds of centrifuges that Quest is going to send out. There's a CL2 centrifuge. Those are the big ones. They do 16 tubes at a time. And then there are H centrifuges, which are our smaller ones uh, that do six tubes at a time. The CL2 centrifuges have an automatic reset, but they reset themselves down to one RPM and I think like 10 minutes of spin. We need them to spin at 3.2 RPM, and they need to run for 15 minutes. So if the power has gone out, if you've just gotten them and they just got shipped, you just need to you know, toggle up to get those settings correct. Because spinning a tube of blood at one RPM is like just putting it on a Ferris wheel. It doesn't really do much. So appreciate you keeping an eye on that. Um, the H centrifuges are preset. You couldn't change them if you wanted to. There is a centrifuge handout, which is another visual aid to show what a um, properly spun tube looks like, um, as well as a packing example. Centrifuge can be an area where it kind of backs up towards the end of the fair. It's very important that the centrifuges keep moving. So say you've just spun six tubes, you can take those six tubes out, put them in a box over here to be sorted, start the next six tubes, and then go back to the sorting process during that 15 minutes while everything is spinning, as opposed to sorting them right out of the centrifuge and taking that time away from the next step that needs to spin. That can really help get your site, keep that flow moving, especially at the end of the fair. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. So here is... A photograph of what a spun versus an unspun tube looks like. And to someone who's in the medical field and has done this for a million years, it's like, well, of course. But if you are not familiar with medical things and you're a centrifuger, say you put your tubes in and it's not spinning properly and they come out looking like the first picture, you may not know that that's not a correct tube and something needs to be addressed. So this is why we, we made this visual aid for people that just have something to refer to. All SSTs do have to be spun. I think that's on the next slide, too. Uh, so we need our, our SST tubes to clot for around 30 minutes, but spinning must be completed within two hours of the draw. So that's the window where you really want to keep those centrifuges moving, is we don't want blood sitting unspun for too long in those SST tubes. Things start to break down, and then we give incorrect results, and nobody wants that. So only the SST tubes are spun. We do not spin purple tubes. The purple top was collected. This is where it, it's kind of a puzzle. That's going to stay in the rack while you're spinning the SSTs that are behind it. And then when those SSTs come out, they need to find their purple friend again and their paperwork and stay in order. So that, that can be a little confusing process for some people. Find somebody who's, who's a little OCD and really organized like that. And have them do double checks and have them be the ones that, that are making sure everything is in order. You cannot double check too many times for me. Um, again, if they have extra te tests, they might have two SSTs. If they have the blood typing, they might have two lavenders and two SSTs. So, cannot test on an unspun SST tube, so it is important that the centrifuges know how vital their job is. Depends on that. All right, this is the part that is the most confusing to a lot of people, and I can understand why. 
Our boxes are packed. These little boxes have 40 holes in them. They're going to go into a bigger box, what we call a baker's box. We try to sort them in three different ways. So if you guys probably can't see this very well. You're going to have diagrams for this. So the top box is an individual test. That person only had one SST drawn. So then the next person, which goes to the right, starts at the bottom left corner, goes to the right, only had one tube drawn. So they all end up in a box together. Second box is sets of two. So it's two rows of 20, or two rows of 10. Good math. Uh, the third box is anything drawn over that. So it's three or four tubes. And they're going to go left to right, 10 to a box. It can be complicated. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I don't want to spend too much time on it here, but it is important that things stay together. Um, so that's what we double check that everything is in order. Electronic requisitions all together in a box with their other electronic friends are going to stay together. Paper requisitions in a different box. And then if you have RAs, they go in a box of their very own as well. There's a packing protocol, so you're going to take the tube rack, you're going to put it inside a Ziploc bag, you're going to put all that whole situation into that baker's box, which is the little box that fits it exactly. You're going to put all the requisitions for that box in the top of that baker's box, and you're going to close it up. And then you're going to have a big shipping box that you're also lining with plastic, and you're going to stack the little boxes into that box. It's a box in a bag in a box in a bag type of situation. Bag in a box with a bag in a box. There you go. So here's just an image of it. So we do need to use that Ziploc bag. That's a, a, a DOT requirement, actually, because these are going to be driven around in the car um, in case of any kind of unforeseen incident or accident. That's a barrier to keep people safe. So you've got the rack covered in the plastic. You've got paper in there. You put it in that little box. And you're going to take the little box and you're going to put it in the big box. This bigger box is going to fit about six of them. And you tie that bag closed and seal that up. On the side of that larger box, there is a sticker that asks for your site name and date and all that information. I really just need to know what your site name is and how many big boxes you're sending. So, you know, Escalante and one out of six boxes. And that way, when I receive this on the dock, I know that I need to be looking for six boxes. And if I've only found four, I need to start making phone calls. So those are the two bits of information that are really important on that sticker. Are there any packing questions? These are awesome. Last thing that I'm gonna ask for you guys to do, there is a confidential envelope that is in the back of your lab supervisor book. In that envelope need to come all of those uh, phlebotomy and centrifuge agreement forms that you had everybody sign at the beginning. This is very important. The cashiers will have an add-on and refund sheet uh, from anybody who wanted to add on a test or get a refund for a test. It is vital that we see that piece of paper the same day as the fair if we don't get it until it's faxed until Monday, we very easily could miss adding on a test. Um, and that would cause a patient to have a redraw. And we try very hard to not have redraws. So it's very important. If the cashiers have not brought that to you, go to the front and ask for it, please. That goes in the confidential envelope. If there's any sort of incident, exposure, injury, and there's paperwork for that, that goes in there as well. And when you seal up that last bigger box of blood, you can just put that paperwork on top and we'll see it when it gets back here. All right, biohazard. We're just gonna make sure that, that we snap the lids on all the biohazard. We don't want anything dribbling. You're gonna take a shipping bag, with a shipping box. You're gonna end up with plenty of boxes. Uh, again, line it with some uh, plastic. There's a bunch of trash bags in there and all the biohazard is going to go in there. That bag gets tied up, and that box gets closed. The biohazard box needs to be clearly defined. There is a small sticker that comes with the supplies that you can put on the box. 
I also prefer a big black Sharpie written all the way across the top. Sharp. Um, that alerts, I have an entire crew of people that just sit and receive things at the back. That alerts them that this box is special, needs to go over here. This one is blood, it goes over here. Um, again, also in case of some sort of accident, we don't want first responders to come across a bunch of biohazard they didn't know was in a car. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. All right, so after the fair, you're going to pack up all the extra lab supplies, and those are going to be picked up by the courier. Biohazard is going to come back with the courier. There are different protocols for centrifuges. Statewide sites are going to send the centrifuges back with their courier. The metro sites are actually flowed by nine health, so your site leadership will know where they need to be taking the smaller centrifuges the day of the fair. So your job is to make sure that they all get packaged up nicely and then somebody will come and get them from you. All right, we're almost done, I promise. Okay, supplies. Traditionally, we've sent out a kit that we call the 100 kit um, or an A box. Because of supply concerns, we're having to bulk out our supplies this year. We simply couldn't get those kits made in the little Django way they were made before. It's the same amount of supplies. They're just going to be bulk. So instead of sharps in four boxes, they'll probably just be four times the sharps in one box. Same amount of supplies, I promise you. We're packing them by hand. So they will still have an A sticker on the side of them to identify that they are lab supplies, but they're not going to look like the boxes that you have seen in the past. Um, it's, but you're going to get everything you need, tubes and wrecks and all the, all the things. You can order extra stuff from me beforehand, but again, like I said, supplies are crazy. So, you get there. There's, there's the slide I don't like. Um, there is a procedure in case somebody is somehow stuck with a needle or exposed to an open blood tube, which should never happen, but... There's a whole procedure. It's outlined in your lab supervisor manual. The procedure is kind of detailed. I'm not going to go through it right now. Just make sure you've read through it once so you're a little familiar. You're going to have that manual with you the day of the fair. Should something happen, keep your participant there. Keep the phlebotomist that was injured there. Follow the procedure, and you're immediately going to call 9Health at this phone number here. The number in your booklet may not reflect this number. This is your one contact number to get a hold of nine for anything. Um, so make sure you write that down and have it with you the day of the fair. There, yeah, that's as far as I'm gonna go with that. There, there are procedures and prophylactics and all kinds of things. Um, but we're not gonna need to do this because we're not gonna have any needle sticks. There you go. All right. We are almost done. Uh, I just, this is an accompanying tool. I know I rushed through things a little and all those fun computer issues, but any questions you have, you can email or call Jerry or myself. Jerry's done this 30 some years. I've done it 19. So we may know the answer. And if we don't, we know who to ask. So we're happy to help you at any time. And my very last slide is this. thank you guys so much. Thank you for volunteering and for being cheery and for helping out your community. Get out there and have a really good fair. With that, we are done.